All right, welcome to uh, CS4510. This is the last day of class. Uh, the topic, this is 20A, the topic is what's called the polynomial time hierarchy. Or sometimes just the polynomial hierarchy. hierarchy. So um, I hope I spelled that right. The polynomial, uh, the polynomial time hierarchy is this fascinating uh, a totally hypothetical made-up device. It, you know, you define a complexity class is usually defined in terms of an algorithmic resource bounds on a kind of class of machines. Uh, you know, polynomial time, polynomial space. You know, you have a resource bound on the number of, amount of resources you can use. Polynomial time hierarchy. Poly, the polynomial hierarchy has three equivalent definitions. None of them are obvious or resource bounded, but they turn out to be all equivalent. You know, there's always the great question, is mathematics discovered or invented? And it turns out if you take something and you define it three different ways, it's probably discovered and not invented, you know. So uh, we will prove uh, the three different definitions of it. And in fact, the polynomial time hierarchy is in fact three, uh, is in fact basically countably inf infinitely many generalizations of the NP versus co-NP problem versus P. So uh, let's recall our structure about P, NP, and co-NP. It looks, P and NP looks like this, probably. We don't know. Um, we have NP, and we also have what is the NP complete problems, the hardest problems in NP. But we also have a class that is called co-NP. Co-NP is almost NP. Uh, actually not. It's the opposite of NP in some sense. Uh, we know that L is in co-NP. Uh, is in co-NP uh, if and only if L complement is in NP. That's just the definition of co-NP, right? Uh, co, any class, even outside of this, means just the complement of the elements. You don't take the complement of the entire class because it's a set of sets of strings. It's, you take the complements of the elements in there, right? Um, and there is actually uh, a, cla a few problems that are known to be what are called co-NP complete. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, this is the picture that, of, that we have between P, NP, and co -NP, we have three classes. They don't fit nicely together like, like Matryoshka dolls. We know you can prove that P is a subset of NP. And for a similar reason, you can prove P is a subset of co -NP. This little egg-shaped avocado region we may describe as co -NP intersect NP. It is not known if co -NP intersect NP is equal to P. We know that P, though, is in this little region because this little region is closed under complement. P is closed under complement, so P must be in here. But we don't know if these equal. We have no idea. Um, there are some natural problems that appear to be verifiable in polynomial time. And their complements appear to be verifiable in polynomial time. But we don't think that we have polytime algorithms for such problems. So it's conjectured that this is the, the model. But it says open a problem. Does, does uh, P uh, equal co-NP uh, intersect NP? is as open a problem as any others. In fact, you can construct a relativized world for both cases to prove that such a proof will uh, be non-relativizing as well. So the, the structure of this is a very, uh, also a hard problem. We have, not only we don't, do not know anything about P versus NP, we don't know anything about NP versus co-NP. Or NP intersect co-NP versus P. So again, several thousand related, but uh, perhaps not by directionally uh, questions among these classes. Let's just let's try to characterize what NP is. NP has several interesting features. First off, it's got a definition in uh, non-deterministic polytime, right? It's got non-determinism. Determinism. By the way, we're going to give three definitions of the same object. The first definition is going to be a little bit abusive, uh, abuse of the notation. So let's try to keep it open binary. So what some of this means? Non-determinism works how uh, it accepts if there exists a computation path, an accepting branch. And it rejects, a non-deterministic machine rejects if all branches reject, right? Right? Um, what else characterizes NP? We also have um, sat is NP complete, and we know phi is in sat uh, if there exists an, uh, uh, an assignment, right? To satisfy it. Um, we also have the verifiable definition, which is that there exists an answer that it must accept, right? So NP is characterized quite well by like an existential everything. I mean, everything about it just seems kind of like those are all the same thing. They're all existentially related to each other. Um, Co-NP has a similar duality. 
Um, it has something called co-nondeterminism. We've never talked about this, but it turns out it's the evil twin of nondeterminism. Co-nondeterminism is exactly what you may think it is, which is that a co-nondeterministic Turing machine accepts if all branches accept, and it rejects if there exists a rejecting branch. There are some also known, uh, there are some known uh, co-NP-complete problems. There is a uh, SAT complement, right? And we may say that phi is in SAT complement uh, if no assignment is satisfying. Another, sometimes it's called unsat. If SAT, you think of the truth table, asking a question about SAT, you're asking basically, Consider the truth table, which is exponentially sized. Does there exist a 1 anywhere in that truth table? You can verify that efficiently. Given a formula, if no assignment is satisfying, what we mean is the entire row of the truth table, 2 to the n, that, that one, excuse me, that column, the last column in the truth table, has 2 to the n elements in it. They're all zeros. You can't efficiently verify sat complement. Like, there doesn't make sense. Like, you can prove to someone a formula is satisfying by just giving the place the 1 exists in that row, in that column. How do you prove to someone that all assignments are unsatisfying? Uh, you can't really do that. Similarly, uh, tautologies is also NP-complete. Excuse me, co-NP-complete. Absolutely not. Tautologies is co-NP-complete, which basically means every assignment is satisfying. And what that means is the entire row is uh, all ones. Yes? Um, when you say like we can't uh, verify that uh, uh, a sad problem cannot be like satisfied. Yes. Um, are you saying that as in like, like we actually can't, or we don't? Ah, uh, well, we provably can't because if you could prove that sad complement was not NP complete, actually, if you could prove sad complement was not in NP, you could prove that there is a problem in co NP and not NP, and that would be sufficient to prove a very great problem. Now, it's not as interesting and it doesn't attract as many flies as the P versus NP problem, but the question of is NP closed in a complement uh, is still as big of an open problem, right? By the way, tautologies, you can't, you can't even, it's true you can't, um, this should not be in NP, but the complement should be in NP. And what would the complement of tautologies be? If tautologies is that every row is, every element on that column is a one, the complement of tautologies would be there exists a zero. And certainly you can verify that by just the assignment is the witness then. So the, certainly that row being a zero is the tautology complement, right? You can verify efficiently if something's not a tautology. In fact, the Cook-Levin theorem basically accidentally, like the original paper by Cook, didn't prove sat was going to be complete. He proved tautologies was going to be complete in some sense um, in, a, in a more like prehistoric way. Um, so these all share kind of the same thing, which is a statement about universal quantification. So the existential quantifier very much characterizes the entire class of NP. The universal quantifier very much characterizes the entire class of co-NP. And NP versus co-NP appear to have the same duality as the existential versus the universal quantifier. These are sort of like the banner flags of these two classes. And that motivates our first definition of the polynomial hierarchy. Does this mean that like you can't, like with things that aren't the things that are deterministic, you can like simulate them as like submodules of another deterministic machine. You cannot do that with non-deterministic machines. Like I cannot simulate a non-deterministic machine, then have its like accept or reject, and then do something with that afterwards. Yes, the non. So I'll tell you that we did hierarchy theorems, and there is a non-deterministic hierarchy theorem. And if the answer, the non-determinist, the hierarchy theorems, if you recall, simulate the machine and then flip the bit. Yeah. But you can't flip the bit if the non-determinism guides you to the correct answer, but does not efficiently guide you to the wrong answer. Yeah. Like if it's no. There is a very complicated automata way around this. Like you have to do some crazy simulation on multiple things. And it turns out that there is still a non-deterministic time hierarchy theorem. And we did mention the statement of the theorem, but not prove it at all. I'll mention it's fairly complicated. But it can, a non, there is, the universal non-deterministic Turing machine is slightly different. And that... It can be done, but it takes like 25 minutes to explain. But even though it's complicated, it is not, you do not do a bunch of complicated things and then end up with a black box that gives accept or reject. You end up with some sort of non-deterministic version of that that yeah. doesn't do the same thing. Yeah. 
Um, so let's, let's define uh, what's called a surgery. Now this is not, again, this is the abusive notation part. It's not real. Okay. If C is any class, C is any algorithmically defined class, uh, define exists C to be uh, like, uh, for C any class, you say W L is in C to mean like W is in L if and only if uh, M on W accepts, right? And M is a C machine. A C machine basically means it has whatever resource bound C has. It has, if M is, uh, if C is poly space, M is a polynomial space machine, right, and so on. This is the definition of like acceptance into a language, right? Define exists C to be uh, uh, like uh, L is in exists C if uh, W is in L, if and only if uh, there exists some X to bring M on WX to accept. Kind of a slightly different definition. You take the logical definition of the class and you surge in an exist existential quantifier so that not, now not only do the machines have, and M is still a C machine, right? M, not, M here doesn't need to just decide L, but actually it's allowed to quantify over an, a string and accept only if the string has certain properties, right? May not be obvious what this is, what power this even gives right now, but it turns out it's quite a lot. What is exist P? P being polynomial time here, that means we have W is an L if and only if there exists some X such that MW X accepts, where M is now a polynomial time bounded machine. NP? NP, why? It's like X certificate. Yeah, that's just the witness definition. That's the witness, that's the verifiable definition of NP. So exist P is simply NP. Okay? I mean, yeah. Think about it. Uh, P, it's like it has to decide SAT. It can't really do it. But exist P it can take on the witness being the satisfying assignment and simply check that it satisfies it or not. And it need only accept if such a satisfying assignment exists. Right? Also, implicitly, whenever I will write, especially for today, whenever I will write exists some X, what I really mean is uh, exists some X, uh, which is an element of a polynomial. It's polynomial length. Something like this, right? Quanti we're going to only quantify over polynomial size strings. So when I say exists X, what I mean is X is polynomial sized. It's important. The verifier definition, of course, also requires this because a polynomial time verifier cannot read an exponentially long witness. You don't have time. There are some problems where it's like, yeah, that does have an exponentially long witness, but that doesn't, it, it ends up being NP hard, but not NP complete for some reasons like this. Um, what about for all P? For all P, for all P is uh, going to be what? For all P is going to be similarly defined. It's going to be uh, W is an L if and only if uh, for all X, M on W comma X accepts. What is for all P? Go NP. Let's prove it. We prove co exists P is equal to for all P. So what we mean is something is in co exists P if it's not in uh, exists P, right? So what we'll say is like W is not in L uh, if and only if uh, there does not exist. Uh, x such that m on uh, w x accepts. Right? Then you take the negation of that statement to be like w is simply an element of uh, the complement if and only if for all x m on w x accepts. Now here you should uh, throw a red flag at me. There's a, there's a small typo on the board. What is it? Should we get M on WX rejects? Yeah. You just be like an M complement or something. Yeah. We want the complement of this statement should be for all X, M on WX rejects. But I'm going to say accept simply because we don't care about rejecting for, from a language in NP as much as we do care about accepting into a language in co-NP, right? It's just a change of perspective. That's not the full complement, but that's okay. Logically, it's the same thing, right? Take the machine that would reject and now just swap the accepted rejection. It's not, not hard. Yes? Uh, 
really get uh, what M's doing with two inputs. Is it like any other machine with two inputs where it's really on one tape, or is it like the Oracle with a separate tape? It's a, think of it like the polytime verifier. The verifier takes on input the word, which is like the problem instance, and then it also takes on a solution. And its only job is to check if the solution is correct. So here, this is a machine that checks the solution. The exist P machine is one that checks the solution is correct. Now here's where some of our intuition about the verifier definition of NP loses. We don't really, how does that even check, how does this machine, uh, the for all P machine work? It doesn't check that X is correct. It, it must accept for all possible answers X. Every single string must bring X to, the M to accept. There should not exist a string that M that brings X to M to reject. Now, it doesn't really fit into our intuition about what that means for um, uh, like verifiable NP, but that's okay. Like, just convince yourself that it's sort of like tautology or something. Every you plug it in, you check it. It's okay. You know. Now you if it if you plug it in you and it doesn't work, you still reject. Right. You can give a co NP machine for tautologies. Same way. Right? Questions on this so far? Okay, what about, um, what about uh, exists, exists P? What is exists, exists P? What is exists, exists P in general? Exists, exists P, we're going to surge in two quantifiers. We have W is an L, if and only if uh, there exists some X1 and there exists some X2. And by the way, implicitly, they're both polynomial size. I'm just not writing it down. Such that M on W, X1, X2 accepts. What conjecturally, conjecture to me, what exists, exists XP is? XP? Yeah, why? I feel like you're not getting much by having a second polynomial size like, uh, witness. Yeah, we have two witnesses. Like, if you, gave a, if you gave the definition of NP two witnesses, it doesn't give any power, it turns out. Let's prove it. Uh, we prove it by double set containment. Let's prove exists, uh, exists P is a subset of exists P. Now, how does that one work? Exists, exists P, you give, if you have an exists, exists P machine, you can construct an exists P machine. How does that work? The witness is just going to be a concatenation of both witnesses. It's going to be like... Here's our exist P machine. It's going to take on input W and then like a single witness, which is going to be some encoding of two witnesses. Something like this, right? And then it's going to simulate uh, the exist exist machine on W, X1, X2. Something like this, right? Perhaps this is an X1 and X2 is an encoding the witness to the exist P machine, the NP machine, is going to be two witnesses. Yes? When we kind of wrote the original definition, was it easier to see that it's like using two witnesses? I thought the definition was that it was like you're simulating on a machine that is an exist P. So like, doesn't M have to be an exist P on X1? Let, 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 let EEP, I'll say EEM here, let EEM be an exists exists machine, we give an exists machine for it. That will prove exists exists P is an exists P. Okay. Yeah. Um, you s the exists machine simulates the exists exists machine. Okay. The other way is simpler. What, why is exists P a subset of exists exists P? Empty yeah, just ignore, like, okay, I have two witnesses. If the first witness is the empty string, then just simulate the exists machine, P machine. Okay. Mm, not a problem. What about exists that, that, that exist P? You have, let's say you have K quantifiers. Yeah, this is just a single quantifier. Exists P is equal to NP, right? Count finitely many more. What is a finite constant times a polynomial? It's still polynomial, right? Finitely many witnesses doesn't really matter. Um, is, could this ever be P? No, because, I mean, we don't think NP... P equals NP. So you can, if you have many quantifiers that are the same, you can always reduce them to a single quantifier, but you can never perhaps get rid of it. Whether or not you can get rid of it would prove P equals NP or not, right? Um, similarly, what is for all, for all P? In K of them. Yeah. 
going to be for all p is equal to cohen p, right? And you can always, two quantifiers that are adjacent and the same, you can always compress them. Okay. Next advancement. What is a, um, for, what about for all exists p? Let's say you surge in two quantifiers and now the order matters. This is the first uh, logical jump. This is defined logically as w is an l, if and only if. Uh, for all x1, there exists an x2, such that m, w, x1, x2 accepts. Now this, like, exists p being np, easy. For all p being co np, okay. What does this even define? Mm. P space. No. Turns out not p space. And actually, actually, you'll see very carefully today why it's not p space. And now, I'll tell you, as we build up this definition, you're gonna, you should be thinking that just sounds like p space, and it won't be p space at the end. Well, let's, let's understand the structure of this class. Okay. First off, what is a subset of for all exists p? Exists p. Exists p is a subset of for all exists p. What else? Yeah, for all p is also a subset of for all exists p. What else? P. P is also a subset of both of those, right? So, okay. Does for all exists p equal exists for all p? Let me hear a conjecture, yes or no. Yeah. Yes. Why? Because the orders of the x1 and x2 don't really matter. Uh, do they not matter? In general logical formula, you cannot permute the quantifiers. I don't mean in the quantification, I mean in the machine encoding. Ah, in the machine encoding, you can swap x1 and x2 and relabel them as x2 and x1, but you cannot swap the computation dependency from one and the other, it turns out. The whole problem with the study of computation is future steps are totally dependent on all previous steps, right? So it turns out, like, we don't think you can swap them. Now, why you can't swap them is a difficult statement to verbalize, but basically we, can't, we don't think we can swap them for the same reason we don't think p equals np, or the same reason co-np equals np. Right? Here's the picture. We have P. Okay? From P, we have defined this class here called uh, exists P, or better known uh, as uh, NP. We have also defined this class, uh, which is called for all P, also known as co NP. Right? Well, if, exists for, if for all exists P contains exists P and for all P, we can draw it like this. I'll draw it over here. This would be for all exist p, and this would be exist for all p. Now, are they equal? Probably not. Um, if they are equal, they'd be closed under complement. We'll discuss the implications of what would happen if such a class could possibly be equal. And there do exist some natural problems that are hard to verbalize, but that appear to be in exist for all p and do not appear to naturally fall into np. These, these, such, uh, such problems exist. Now, what about um, exists, exists, exists for all, exists, exists p? What is that? You can squish all of the exists into exists for all, exists p. Right? Yeah. Now, what do we know about exists for all, exists p? What does it contain as subsets? For all exists p and exists for all p. It contains for all exists p and exists for all p. It contains both these as subsets. That's the polynomial time hierarchy. Here's the picture of it. Now, you know, at, at some point, actually, I'm sure you could write, write up something about the complexity of a Venn diagram, right? If you have a Venn diagram, how many, you have two to the n possible overlaps if you have n, if you have n circles, right? For every possible pair, of, you choose a subset of those to overlap. Now, we don't draw the polynomial time hierarchy as a Venn diagram because it's annoying. 
Uh, but let's generalize the following uh, countably infinite number of times. We have what's called a base case, which is pi 0 p. Sometimes I'll drop the p subscript, but different hierarchies. There's an exponential time hierarchy. It turns out uh, there's like the arithmetical hierarchy. There's a Boolean hierarchy. There's a million hierarchies, co-analytic hierarchy, whatever. These, no these notations get mixed up. But when we're referring to polynomial time hierarchy, we put, put a p there. Sometimes I'll forget it, though. Uh, this we just say is sigma 0 p, which is equal to uh, the class p of polynomial time. Then we'll say that sigma i is going to be equal to exists for all p. You put i quantifiers in front of p, 20 quantifiers, 20 million quantifiers, whatever. You put finitely many quantifiers alternating in front of p, and the first quantifier must be an existential one. Then pi of p uh, is equal to for all exists p, and you put i quantifiers in front of that. That's, those are what are called levels of the polynomial time hierarchy. Um, and in fact, what you can do is define a level in terms of the previous levels, because this sigma ip is simply exists what? Pi ip, yeah. Pi i minus 1p. Pi i minus 1p. Right? You took the previous level, surged it in a class. Similarly, this is a, this is a for all on a sigma i minus 1 p. We notice the following relationship between uh, classes. Okay, For all i, we observe this generalization we did. We have uh, pi i is a subset of pi i plus 1. You agree? Uh, for all i, we also have that sigma i p is a subset of sigma i plus 1. We have, uh, for all p, for, excuse me, for all i, we have sigma i is a subset of pi i plus 1, and that we have uh, pi of i p is a subset of sigma i. We have double, done a double induction to, to define these classes. Let's draw a picture of it. Now, I'm not going to draw a Venn diagram of this because it's too complicated, but we'll do an arrows. So we have as our base case, we have p. Okay? From p, we define sigma 1 and pi 1. Sigma 1 is just np, though. And pi 1 is just co-np, right? Um, but what do we know about pi 2 and sigma 2? Uh, well, pi 1 is contained in pi 2, and pi 1 is also contained in sigma 2. Sigma 1 is contained in pi 2, and sigma 1 is also contained in, pi, uh, in sigma 2, right? Do it again. Pi 2p, pi sigma 2p. Suppose I had an infinitely tall board, OK? That is the polynomial time hierarchy. A level of the polynomial time hierarchy is just sigma i union pi i. That's what we would call like a level. This is infinitely tall building, right? We define the polynomial hierarchy itself as a class to be the union from i equals 0 to infinity of sigma i p, which happens to be equal to i equals 0 to infinity of pi ip, right? Those two are equal. All right, it took us that long to arrive at one definition of the polynomial time hierarchy. Any questions? We'll talk, the first half is only on the definition. What is this thing? The second half is on applications, like what, why is, do we care? For now, let's just make sure we understand the definition. Each one is defined logically this way. Now, it's not an, a nice algorithmically defined class, the way that p is like poly time, p space is like poly space, it's like, what does it mean for a machine to decide a language in one of those classes? It's not obvious yet to us. But certainly, this is the definition. Any questions on that? Um, you may also observe that each sigma i, what is co sigma i p? What is the complement of the elements of one of the right halves of the levels of the polynomial time hierarchy?
Okay. Yeah. So although it seems complicated, it has kind of predictive structure, you know. Um, again, just think about that Venn diagram over there, but if I did it infinitely, infinitely tall. Um, one of the reasons my personal interest in the polynomial time hierarchy is because complexity theory can make you feel like a wizard. Uh, that's a cool diagram. It's like something someone would draw with chalk, and you're casting a dark magic spell or something. You know, uh, you leave this on the board, no one knows what's going on. This is called computer science, by the way. This is, we're still in computer science class. Um, and even though, like, you know, in computability theory, we dealt with like undecidable problems and all this cool extremal philosophical stuff, here we get a lot of I would like to call play. We have non-determinism, and we have, uh, you know, this this idea of surging in a quantifier with hard to describe power. Yet I claim these are all still subsets of the decidable languages, right? Um, uh, okay, let's upper bound it. What is a? Give me an upper bound on the polynomial time hierarchy. What is a class that upper bounds? Polynomial time hierarchy. P space. P space. Now, we don't think P equals the polynomial time hierarchy equals P space. But to give you some like evidence about why you don't think it should equal P space, P space you may have defined in terms of these alternating quantifiers because you know TQBF is P space complete, right? You recall any number of quantifiers for any formula that this generalization of SAT is NP complete. I mean P space complete. So you may think. Polynomial hierarchy is p-space complete. I mean, polynomial hierarchy is p-space. But it turns out it's like uh, if you do w in uh, if you look do w in l, uh, which is in p-space, what this basically means is like longer strings, longer w, use more quantifiers. But uh, if w is in l is in say sigma three then longer w still has to use still only three quantifiers. So it's like, you know, like if you, if you formalize the game of chess, you can formalize that within p space. Ch chess with a polynomial bound on the number of moves is going to be p space complete because the number of moves made will be the number of quantifiers. But you could not formalize that, for example, in, in sigma 3 because in the third level of the polynomial hierarchy, because like how do you do 10 moves, right? Not obvious. You have to measure like a different kind of complexity. It turns out. Any questions on this? Yes. We will discuss the con. So the definition of the polynomial time hierarchy is complicated. But then applying like how what it says about the other classes, this the proofs are like one sentence long. So there's a trade-off between how hard it is to understand this definition of one item to how easy it is to apply it. We'll talk about the applications. In a minute, but I'm going to give you a second equivalent definition of polynomial time hierarchy, um, and we'll we'll get to that. There is definitely like relationships between all the hard problems: p versus np versus co np versus p versus p space, p versus x, uh, np versus p slash poly. And the polynomial time hierarchy makes itself extremely useful. That's why it, we should learn things, not just because they're hard, but because they're useful. Um, so it turns out that there's three equivalent definitions of the polynomial time hierarchy. This one is in form of alternating quantifiers, but it was actually not the first definition. You can relativize not just a problem. The second definition was done in terms of oracles. So for any class, we may write like uh, NP to the NP to be like, uh, for all A in NP to be a union of the relativizations of N for each language in NP. So you take each class and you give it an oracle for every possible language in NP. It turns out that NP to the NP is just equal to NP to the what? Sad. Yeah. It turns out if you can just like, because, N because sad is NP complete, it turns out that those are the same. So we'll use a relativization of a class to another class almost as an abusive notation. Here's the... Um, Oracle definition of the polynomial time hierarchy, and we'll prove it, quote unquote. We say sigma 0p is equal to p, and then we say sigma 1p is equal to np, and then we say sigma 2p is equal to np with an oracle for np, and then we say sigma ip is equal to np with an oracle for np with an oracle for np. i times. Okay, NP, sigma IP is equal to a non-deterministic polynomial time machine with an oracle 
to a class which is itself uh, non-trivial polynomial time with an oracle and so on, right? Um, Does like each machine and NP to the NP have like access to all the oracles, or is it just the uh, of all of the individual? Here's the unabusive notation. Oh, and I'll also say that pi i p is just then defined to be co sigma i p. But the unabusive notation is that you define uh, sigma i plus one. I will say sigma i p to be equal to n p with an oracle for the previous class. But the oracle, like each machine, that like like. In order for something to be in sigma IP, there must be a sigma IP machine, which yes. is decided. That sigma IP machine has one oracle, and that oracle is for a specific language in sigma I minus 1P. Correct. And it turns out, we'll prove it later, but every level of the polynomial time hierarchy has a complete problem. SAT is NP complete. It turns out that each one has a generalization of SAT, which is <laughs> complete for that class only. Which you cannot. Like, it doesn't have an oracle for, like, all the machines. Simul like, one, mach one instance no. of a machine doesn't have an oracle. It has, a, is, it has an oracle to one class. But that class is defined recursively to be such that it is a non-deterministic machine with an oracle for the previous class and so on. Yeah. Uh, very difficult definition to work with, I think. But it's true. Um, this is the uh, oracle definition of NP. Well, let's prove the equivalence, quote unquote. We're just going to sort of allude to what the proof is. We will prove that sigma i is equal to NP sigma i minus 1, okay? Um, where this is defined with the quantifier definition, and this is defined with the oracle definition, right? So if we were to proceed by induction, and I'm not going to do the proof in extreme detail. I'm just going to sort of high level paintbrush this out. The base case is the same, right? So if, if this is done with the quantifier definition, and this is done with the oracle definition, and if we can prove these, then we're good. Let's do uh, equivalence with a double set containment. We prove that, um, which way do they do first? We prove that sigma i p is contained in n p to the sigma i minus 1 p. Okay? Non-deterministic machine with an oracle for a class that's hard to think about what it looks like. We'll prove that everything decidable in sigma i p is in this class. Uh, if L if, uh, if, if L is an element of sigma IP, then we know that W is an L if and only if, according to the quantifier definition, which also is an abusive notation, but the quantifier definition says exists for all, I'll say it this way, exists x1 for all x2 uh, I times something QI, something XI, some quantifier i, where this is an existor for all, depending on the parity. We have i quantifiers here, such that m, w, x1, xi accepts. Right. Um, here's what we're, we're going to do. Uh, for now, just fix, uh, just fix x1. Hard code x1 for a second. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about getting x1 back in there. Hard code uh, x1 for just a moment. Then we have uh, w is an L. And by hard code x1, I mean hard coded into m. Let it not be quantified over. Let it be hard coded and fixed into m. We have w is an L if and only if. Uh, for all x2, that, that, that qi, xi, um, m, uh, w, x2, xi accepts, right? What kind of statement is that, though? That's a pi of pi minus. Yeah, so if you have an oracle for pi i minus 1, you can decide that, you can query the oracle with a statement of that form and return an answer. But we don't have a pi i minus 1 oracle. We have a sigma i minus 1 oracle. But that's OK, because an oracle is unbiased in power, unlike non-determinism. Non-determinism and also co-non-determinism say yes really easily and say no really hard. 
right? But an oracle will say yes or no equivalently. So what we're going to do is that this is just a negated, this is a negated, um, this ends up being a negated uh, sigma i minus 1 query. So you ask your oracle about the query, and if it says no, then you say yes, and if it says yes, you say no. So you simulate the sigma i minus 1, the pi i minus 1 query using the sigma i minus 1 query, right? Now, how do you get back x1? Non-deterministically pick it at the start. Yeah, just guess. Instead of hard coding x1, just non-deterministically guess it. So, and recall that we have a non-deterministic machine with Oracle access to sigma i minus 1 p, right? It uses the non-determinism for x1, and then it does the negation of the query for the other i minus 1, I minus one quantifiers. This is sufficient for us. To, this is a simulation of a sigma i p machine on an np to the sigma i minus 1 machine. Okay? Uh, the reverse direction... I'm not going to do it. This is the harder direction, it turns out. The other one is just very detailed filled. And I'll just kind of allude to how it works. You want to simulate an NP sigma i minus 1 machine on a sigma i to the p machine. I believe that you could go off and maybe spend some time and figure this out for yourself. It's not too hard. Seeing the answer also is not too hard. Not too hard. But I'll just allude to, it's very similar to the proof that we've already done, uh, but just with a lot more notation in the way, of uh, where we prove that non-deterministic polynomial time is equivalent to deterministically verifiable. Computation. Recall that we said non-determinism was just the same power as this witness, quantification over the witness. So this proof ends up being the same for the, for the reverse direction. Uh, so that's sufficient for us to say that the oracle definition is sufficient. Right? We have this quantifier definition, and we have the oracle definition as well. Right. Questions? OK, we have a third definition of the polynomial time hierarchy. Uh, and it is a more algorithmically defined one. So we have non-determinism and we have co-non-determinism. What happens if you have both? Let's say you have both non-determinism and co-non-determinism. What can you do with access to both of those things? So we define what's called an alternating Turing machine. An alternating Turing machine has access to non-determinism and co-non-determinism. It can basically choose between its two transition functions whether it wants to do non-determinism or co-non-determinism. Pictorially, you should just think of the branching, uh, what it does on the binary tree, right? When you have a non-deterministic Turing machine, it's allowed to make existential quantifications, right? Oh, the computation tree of a non-deterministic Turing machine may look like this, right? And a non-deterministic Turing machine accepts if there exists a computation branch, right? So let's say this machine accepts, let's say this is the accepting computation branch, right? It goes down that path and it finds the accept and it accepts, right? Um, an alternating Turing machine, though, is allowed access to both existential branching and universal branching. So what it can look like is this. Let's say you, have, you start with a universal branch and then... On, on your branches, which are done universally, you do those existentially, perhaps. So this, this machine accepts if both of these branches accept, and this branch accepts if one of its branches accept. So for example, this would be an accepting computation of a alternating Turing machine. Let's do it like that. Let's do it like that, right? Both of these branches accept because both of these branches accept, and this branch accepts because one of these accepts, right? So you have alternating power. What can you do with an alternating Turing machine? What possible thing can you do with this much extra power? Um, it's curious. If we said, uh, give me a, a class that we know that you would conjecture that AP is equal to. It's something we know already, it turns out. AP would be exp. It, AP is a subset of exp, but is not known to be equal to exp. 
And we'll discuss the simulation of AP on like deterministic, deterministically. There's another class, like smaller than exp, but only slightly so. Is there like a limit to the number of? Not yet. Right now, you have unbounded quantification. AP is alternating polynomial time. It must run in polynomial branching depth, right? Like NP. But no, yeah. Is it linear exponential? I'll say also no, because E is not closed under polytime reduction, and it turns out that AP is closed under polytime reduction. It's a slightly smaller class, perhaps debatably smaller. Let's start naming classes that we know. First of all, it's bigger than NP. P space. P space, yeah, it's P space. Turns out AP is equal to P space. How do we prove that two classes are equal? Do we do a double set containment? Let's prove that AP is a subset of P space. Give me a deterministic algorithm to simulate an alternating Turing machine in polynomial space. Remember we did TQBF, we did the, we did the linear space algorithm for TQBF, where we divided and conquered every time we saw an, if we saw a uh, existential quantifier, we branched, we did divided and conquered, and we accepted if one of those branches accept. We saw a universal quantifier, we branched if one of those, both of those computations accepted, but we made sure the recursive calls reuse space. Basically, the simulator of an AP machine in polynomial space is just the TQBF algorithm. Right. That uses, in fact, linear space. So AP is in P space. Divide and conquer, you can simulate such a machine with no more than polynomial space overhead. Um, to prove that P space is a subset of NP, it turns out all we need to do is argue that AP is closed under polytime reduction, and that TQBF, which is P space complete, is an element of AP. Why is TQBF an AP? TQBF, if you recall, looks something like uh, like f exists x1, uh, where x1 is a Boolean variable for all x2, exists x3, exists x4, whatever. These are like the satisfying variables, and then you have some CNF phi, right? It turns out you can decide if that is true or not in, poly in alternating polynomial time by simply doing the same existential branches uh, and universal branches as the quantifiers you have in order. If you see an existential quantifier, you make an existential branch. If you see a universal quantifier, you make a universal branch. It's the same reason uh, that SAT is in NP, essentially. Those quantifiers have to alternate? In the definition of, uh, as the definition we've given of an alternating machine, they do not. In the definition of the polynomial time hierarchy, they do. But it turns out, we'll say why those are equivalent. You call it alternating, but it doesn't alternate. It gets to alternate between its two choices. We'll prove it in a second. <laughs> why, when we do it, when we make the analogy towards a polynomial time hierarchy, this, I, I will resolve your question. I think you promise. Um, yeah, like, but you could like require, like there's no bound on the number of quantifiers. You require, right? So because like, like this one has to be simulated on like, Poly, like poly time. exactly one machine which can figure this out for all instances of yeah and it's allowed to make as many branches the input the input will definitely have a linear amount of quantifiers though so in fact this is a linear time algorithm for it but like can you represent some, such a thing with like a finite set of states and a finite transition function uh yes it's like i read the the alternating machine will be like if the first quantifier is an existential one use non-determinism then on each of those branches, if the next quantifier is a universal one, use conon determinism, and so on. Okay. It's yeah. not intuitive to fathom what the computation of this looks like, because we are barely holding on to fathoming what non-determinism looks like, right? This is not obvious how the computation works. There is a formal definition, and you could delegate to that. But uh, with respect to the definition we're doing, this is abusive notation. But you have like a finite transition function that generates an unbounded computation, like a Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Same reason, I mean, think about SAT being an NP. What you do is the, the satisfying assignment is the witness, right? 
One more thing I'll say is in TQBF, each Boolean is, this is a Boolean, but in uh, uh, what will relate to the polynomial time hierarchy, you quantify over a polynomial string, polynomially many variables, right? Not just a, a, a true or a false. That's also a subtle difference there. I'm going to leave this diagram and not erase it. Questions on AP equals P space? High level proof, not too in depth. Um, it turns out like what happens if you throw an A in front of the other classes? So we know, uh, we can prove um, L is a subset of P, which is a subset of P space, which is a subset of X, which is a subset of X space, right? Similarly, we know that AL is a subset of AP, which is a subset of AP space, which is a subset of whatever, right? Something like this. Oh, AXP, yes. Sorry, I gave up too soon. But it turns out that those are actually the same. It turns out that alternating logarithmic space is equal to polynomial time. It turns out that alternating polynomial time is equal to polynomial space. And it turns out that alternating polynomial space is equal to exponential time, and so on. Alternating exponential time is equal to uh, exp space, exponential space. It's as if, if you just threw an A in front of it, that you just shift everything over by one. Kind of a cool theorem. When, everyone, when this case, stuff came out in the 70s, everyone was like, I don't know where you would use that, but that's cool. right?" So throw an A in front of it, everything shifts over. Let's tie this back into the polynomial time hierarchy. Let's shift everything over by, uh, well, let's consider like an alternating Turing machine is allowed to make as many universal or existential quantifications as it wants. It's allowed to swap between them as often as it needs. But let's suppose you put a bound on the number of quantifiers, the, lot, the amount of times it's allowed to switch. So you must decide longer and longer strings in languages, but you're not allowed access to more than a few quantifiers, right? So uh, let's define sigma i time uh, f of n to be uh, an alternating machine machine can make no more than uh, i uh, branches and first is an existential branch. It's a, it starts with non-determinism. Similarly, we may define pi i time f of n. Oh, and it runs in f of n steps to be the same, except it starts with a universal uh, for all pi, right? It's not obvious why this is the same as, uh, it turns out this will end up being the same as the polynomial time hierarchy. It turns out that, uh, for example, six sigma i p is equal to the union of time, uh, sigma i time, uh, n to the k, for a k is equal to zero to infinity, right? And so on. But it's not obvious why the alternating machine corresponds exactly to that, le to that level of the polynomial time hierarchy, except in the sense that I have finally many quantifiers, I have finally many quantifiers, okay, done. Um, so what I'm gonna do is try to allude to you why sigma one time poly is equal to what? What is sigma one time poly equal to? NP, yeah. Um, so here's the difference between them. An NP machine is allowed unlimited access to non-determinism, okay? A sigma one time machine is allowed one branch of non-determinism, and then the rest of the computation must be done deterministically. Right. The problem again with computation is that all future steps are are the, a future step is a function of all previous steps. That's sort of the, the, the difficulty with analyzing computation. You can consider a non-deterministic branch to be like this, right? Who's to say that future um, future non-determinism is dependent upon uh, something like this? Who's to say 
that non-deterministic steps in the future are not dependent upon non-deterministic steps in the past. This, would, we would say, is an NP machine. I claim that you can simulate an NP machine in such a way such that all the non-determinism can be done in a single step at the beginning, and then the rest of the computation is done deterministically. Now, the proof is done by a picture. Here's our sigma one time machine. Uh, we're going to, instead of selecting uh, a sequence of non-deterministic steps, what we're going to do is use non-determinism to guess all future non-deterministic guesses and perform them all at once. Uh, okay. Now, that's a proof picture. It's not a proof, but you guys should understand what's going on. Can, you could flip two coins, or you could roll a four-sided die. Those are the same thing. Right? Same QED. That's sort of what goes on here. Um, this is analogous to quantifier compression. Exists, exists P is just exists P, which is just NP. Making two non-deterministic jumps is the same, right? And you had a, you, you had a question about, like, is it okay that it, it needs to be alternating or not? And it turns out, if it's not alternating, let's say you have exists, exists, for all exists, you can simulate that on an exists, for all exists jump. Right? Um, so we see that each level of the polynomial time hierarchy is, correlate, is cor defined three ways. The quantifier definition, the, um, higher, the, the, the relativizations of relativizations definition, oracles upon oracles, and then finally with an automata definition of a machine with access to non-determinism and co-non-determinism with finitely many bounds. These, this is the definition of the polynomial hierarchy three ways. The polynomial hierarchy, by the way, not an easy object to define. We spent the whole one hour just on the definition. The next half, I promise, will be easier on applying the definition. But before we do that, do we have any questions on just simply any of the three definitions given? Do we understand the polynomial hierarchy? If I ask you to draw a picture of the polynomial hierarchy, you guys could do it, right? Perfect. <laughs>